Okay, we're going to be looking at Three Battles from the War of 1812, published by High Flying Dice Games and designed by Paul Rohrbach. Two of the battles are from 1814 and one's from 1813. First is the Battle of Krasner's Farm, November 11th. Second is the Battle of Chippewa, July 5th, 1814. And the third is the Battle of Lundy Lane, also in 1814. Now the games can be purchased in several different ways. I decided to get the mounted counters version. So here are the counters mounted. Be forewarned, they're not die cut. You have to cut them out with uh, X-Acto knife, so be very careful with that. You can also get the uh, counters unmounted. And there's Chippewa, again, unmounted. Kaiser's Farm, I've already cut the counters out, and I opted for the special cards that you can purchase. That's optional, because it's going to use a regular deck of cards for their um, activation system. All three games share a common set of rules, so if you have read the rules for one game, you more or less know how to play them all. Very similar combat system and movement system for all three. Now I'll show the counters and the maps for all three, but I'll concentrate mainly on the Battle of Chrysler's Farm for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I worked at the Battlefield of Chrysler's Farm in 1974 and 75 as a guide, and uh, that was a really good summer job. That's what got me interested in the War of 1812. I'm more familiar with that battle. Back in 75, when I was working there, I would have loved to have a game like Chrysler's Farm. I was a war gamer even back then. I'd been gaming for about six years. But at that time, there was really no War of 1812 game where I could exercise my war game outlet. Except for Gamma 2's very fine game, War of 1812. But there was no battle games on the war. So this is a refreshing new series from High Flying Dice Games. Now, the games can be purchased in several different ways. I decided to get the mounted counters version. So here are the counters mounted. Be forewarned, they're not die cut. You have to cut them out with uh, X-Acto knife, so be very careful with that. You can also get the uh, counters unmounted. And there's Chippewa, again, unmounted. Kaiser's Farm, I've already cut the counters out, and I opted for the special cards that you can purchase. That's optional, because it's going to use a regular deck of cards for their um, activation system. Now the cover artwork for Chrysler's Farm was a little strange. That illustration is actually of General Brock at Queenston Heights, fought in October of 1812. Brock, of course, was killed at battle, so he was long gone by the time of Chrysler's Farm. So I've always wondered why that artwork was chosen, since it is not representative. Now the artwork for Chippewa is correct. That's from a painting of the U.S. regulars advancing at Chippewa. And this one is also correct. That's an illustration of the Americans charging up the hill uh, at Lundy Lane. This is a panorama painting done by Adam Sheriff Scott, now deceased, and it shows the Battle of Chrysler's Farm late afternoon on November 11th. Off in the background here you can see the Chrysler House. I think that's the Browse House. Chrysler Island. There's the British gunboats. This is the British line here. 49th and 89th regiments. American regiments here. And American Dragoon Charge. And at this point the Americans are being routed from the battlefield background is the St. Lawrence River. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer on this one. It's a beautiful mural painting and it is in the Battle Memorial Building at Kaiser's Farm Battlefield Park. Part of my job is to explain this painting to visitors, let them know what's going on. This is a close-up view of the battlefield. Here you can see the Chrysler House, John Chrysler, two of the British gunboats, 
firing from the St. Lawrence River. These are the single six-pounder British guns firing here. There's a courier, and that would be Colonel Morrison and his staff. Here's the British line, 49th Regiment, in their gray overcoats, because it was November, and the 89th, who still had their red coats. And the main American line here. There were about six regiments of Americans at Battle Cruisers Farm, and only two British regulars. The British were outnumbered about three to one at this battle. It's a humiliating defeat for the American army. And here in the background you can see the American troops beginning to fall back, trying to pull, pull away one of their guns. I'll move over to the left, and we'll see the rest of the painting. Finally, the left, or rather the rear of the American army, American units streaming towards the rear, and that's the British, or rather the Navy, American Navy, anchored at Cook's Point. So that's Adam Sheriff Scott's very fine painting of the Battle of Chrysler's Farm. It's well done. If you ever get up to Morrisburg, Ontario, Upper Canada Village, you might want to visit the Battle Memorial Building. It's quite, quite nice to see. Now all of the maps in the series are very small. They're 11 inches wide and 70, 17 inches long. So they are small maps. And I have more to say about the Chrysler's Farm map, but uh, I'll keep that for later. Now I'm gonna orient the map the other way so it matches the painting, so you'll understand what we're looking at. So the painting's viewpoint this long thing here is the ravine. In the game, it's just a stream. He calls it a creek. And there's a second creek and a third creek, smaller ravines. So the orientation of the painting is we're more or less here looking this direction. So the American line would be kind of here and the British line is up here. And the gunboats are actually back there on the river. In the game, he's got the gunboats right at the mouth of the ravine. That's a little close, but anyway, that's the game. And uh, there's some woods here, and Cook's Point would be just off the map. The map is small, and this black ash woods here is not shown in the painting. We're kind of like in the woods looking this way. So. I have some criticisms of the map, and the other ones too, which I'll show you. My main beef is that the map is too light, way too light. Now there's only two types of terrain here, open, level one, and open level two. And level two is not delineated very clear. If I'm reading it right, the high ground is just this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hexes here open terrain level two. But the map is so light that it's very, very hard to distinguish the two. Now it could be because it's Chrysler's Farm and I'm very familiar with it, but I'm a little disappointed that some of the most basic historic sites are not shown on the map. For example, the King's Road, should have been labeled at least the King's Road, and very disappointed that the Chrysler House is not depicted on the map. It should be about here. And this forest, as far as I can tell, from all the maps I've looked at, is really non-existent. This was all cleared land. This was Chrysler's farm. It was a farm, and it was cleared. The Nine Mile Road appears to be missing, but it should be here, moving up this way. Will this make any difference to the game? No, it won't. But I'm a little disappointed that the historic sites were not even mentioned because uh, Cook's Point, where the American fleet was, should really be shown here. Now, this second growth woods was there, but literally it was second growth. It was not a forest, it was just bushes and stuff, almost like the wilderness. So that's my main criticism of these maps. And the other two are very similar. They're very, very light. This is virtually a, a print and play game. Now, um, no, I didn't print and play them. These are ones purchased from the company. 
but I think um, these maps should be a lot darker. Over on the left here, you have your turn record track. And here's your game record track where you will be scoring victory points. Now each turn seems to represent about 45 minutes. Like I said, all of the games share a common movement and combat system. Like I mentioned before, you don't have to purchase the cards, but I did. So you cut them out from the uh, stock. They're double-sided. There's an American deck and a British deck. For Chrysler's Farm, the Americans move first on turn one by rolling a die, and that's how many activities they get. Later on, each side will draw from the deck. Of course, this will be hidden from your opponent. And the card will tell you how many activities you get. So in this case, the British would have one activity. And after doing that activity, the Americans would draw a card. And in this case, you'd have two activities. So it goes back and forth. And that's generally how the game works. Back and forth with these cards. And being cognizant of the turn record on the left. Because the game starts at 10.30 and ends at about 4.30 in the afternoon. Now the Battle of Chrysler's Farm was the most Napoleonic, I suppose, of the battles fought in North America. It was very much like a Napoleonic battle in Europe, with the both sides of regulars lined up against each other and banging away, trying to make the other fellow retire from the field. Now I'm going to show you more or less how the units were set up at the beginning of the Battle of Chrysler's Farm. Now I have not placed all of the units on the board, just some representative units to give you an idea what the American and British start was like. The American army was massed around here Cook's Point, where they, near where they landed. The Voltigeurs and the Indians were guarding the British left flank, kind of like skirmishers. 49th Regiment was deployed here, Leeds Militia, Prescott Volunteers here, and the 89th Regiment back here. And uh, that's depicted, remember, in the painting. So we're opposite from the direction of the painting, but the opening of the battle kind of went like this, and I'll show you the stages. The American army advanced against the British line. So in the initial stages, the American line went forward and met with the Voltigeurs and Indians in the woods. Voltigeurs more or less fell back, doing their job as skirmishers, and the American army advanced in a line, like so. You can see the combat factors on the left and the movement factors on the right, too. So the, movie is, uh, the movement is slow, only one or two. The counters are double-sided. When they take losses, they're flipped to the other side. As the battle developed, the Americans continued their advance. The Americans advanced against the British left, like so, and slow and steady moved against the British. I said very Napoleonic style. Now at one point in the battle, um, the 49th had to bend back their flank like that. And the Americans tried to outflank the Americans, or the British rather. And the Voltigeurs and Indians kept sniping at the US troops in the line. Now I'll show you the climax of the battle and we'll turn the map 180 degrees around so it matches with the painting, so you'll be able to see overall what transpired. And we'll refer to the painting occasionally to show you what happened. But more or less, the American line came up against the British line, actually on this high ground back here. British fell back. Um, I'm not so sure about this high ground. There really was no high ground. It was a farm, Mr. Chrysler's farm, and it was all just flat farm fields. But the Americans continued their advance, and the British continued with their platoon fire, and they just kind of demoralized the Americans, and uh, Americans couldn't make much headway against the British line. It was rather steadfast. So the climax in the painting 
is when the lines were very close to each other. In late afternoon, the dragoons charged up this road and tried to strike the right flank of the British here. And we'll show that in the painting there. You can see the dragoons charging against the British right flank, them refusing their right. And when the dragoons were repulsed, the American army kind of lost heart and low in ammunition. It was fought in November, a little bit of flecks of snow in the air. It was cold, rainy. It was late afternoon, and the American army just called it quits. So they began retreating to their boats, and Morrison was left in the field at Chrysler's Farm. Okay, we're going back to that north-south orientation again. American army falling back. Now here's the peculiar thing about this battle. It's like no other battle in the War of 1812. It's very, very weird. Yes, it is very Napoleonic in nature. But here's the oddity of the campaign. That's north. That's the St. Lawrence. That's east. And that's where Montreal is. Kingston is this direction. And you can see where the embarrassing situation of the American army being in front of the British this little corps of observation, 800 men, was following behind the American army, almost pushing it towards Montreal. So when Wilkinson camped here at Cook's Point and the corps of observation moved against his rear, he turned around the rear of the army, faced it west and charged across the fields and was defeated. So when his army retreated back here to Cook's Point. It was in total confusion the afternoon of November 11th. They had to embark back on their boats and continue towards Montreal. Now, it was at that point that General Wilkinson learned that General Hampton, who was also marching up from New York from Chateau Gay, way to the east against Montreal, had been turned back at the Battle of Chateau Gay. So at that point, he just said, ah, that's it. Campaign's over. And the American army crossed the St. Lawrence and retired for the winter at uh, Salmon Mills, New York, giving the British the total victory in the campaign. So it, it, it's a very odd battle in a very odd campaign. Um, if you read about the campaign, you'll find out that Wilkinson and Hampton didn't like each other. And uh, they, you couldn't have picked any worse commanders to command the campaign. Let's get back to the game. The rules come very basically, which again surprised me. There's only, I think it was 12 pages of rules and they're just stapled together. They're not even double-sided, which I thought was odd. If you say paper, why not make them double-sided? So it's just the rules stapled together. Well, I always work with copies anyway, so I just made copies, made them double-sided and I could yellow in and highlight any of the things uh, uh, that I might forget in the game. Now, in, uh, so what, how many pages are we? One, two, three, four, five, we got six pages of rules, and one of them is designer's notes, so it is not a complicated game. In complexity, I'd almost put it at uh, the level like the quads were back with SBI back in 1975. It's a very good introductory game. Um, the combat is simple, you roll a dice compared to the combat factors of the defenders, you get points for eliminating uh, units, which you keep track on the uh, victory point track. It's a very simple game. Um, is it Napoleonic? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Because it's such a simple game, I can't say that you're going to learn anything new about Napoleonic tactics by playing this game. It's just a very basic introductory game. And uh, that's all right. We need introductory games in the hobby. But don't think for one minute that by playing these games here, you're going to be learning all about tactical Napoleonics. Um, you will not. They are very basic. And I'm not sure what lessons you're going to learn about the battles. For example, playing this, I've played it a bit now. I'm not sure if you're going to learn anything more about the battle by playing it. So why did the British win when they only had 800 men and the Americans had close to 4,000? Well, morale and weather 
a lot of factors gave the British their victory. So I'm not sure if you'll learn those lessons from uh, playing the Battle of Cresles Farm game. Let's take a quick look at Chippewa and Lundy's Lane. Okay, now we're looking at the battlefield of uh, Chippewa, fought on July 5th, 1814. I should point out that the armies that met at Chippewa that summer, they're the same armies that met at L uh, Lundy's Lane 20 days later. So it's two battles of the same campaign. I th thought it odd that if you were going to start a new series on the War of 1812, you would pick uh, two battles from 1814, one from 1813, and I believe there's another one planned, Fort Erie, which is also 1814. And I think they're doing a Queenston Heights game too, which is 1812. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, there's the battlefield of Chippewa. Now I have the same uh, criticisms of this map that I have of the uh, Chrysler's Farm one. It's a little on the light side. I'm not as hard on the historic sites because Chippewa was fought in kind of an open field away from any settled territory. That's the Niagara River on the right, and uh, we're looking north and south here. That's Streets Creek, and um, I'm quite shocked that the main Niagara Portage Road is not even shown. That's um, very strange to me. It doesn't have much effect on the game, I understand, but um, I wish it had been depicted. There was actually a little wee bridge here, which is not shown also. There's the Chippewa River, which was a fairly big obstacle. They call it a river bridge here. And uh, it's a straightforward battle. I don't have the counters punched on this one. There's your order of battle. Not a lot of counters. Small British army under General Ryle. Larger army under General Brown. Fairly equal. And it's the battle where um, Americans made their name with their, their infantry. I think by 1814, certainly the summer of 1814, the American infantry was as good as the British infantry. Not so perhaps in 1812 or 1813, but by 1814 the American infantry was quite good. Here in the painting is shown the uh, um, American regulars in gray coats. And it's supposed that when General Ryle saw them advancing, and realized that they were not militia, and he yelled out, by God, those are regulars. And cer they certainly were. Now, Chippewa is a straightforward soldier's fight. The Americans come across here, across Streets Creek, and the battlefield more or less took place here in this open terrain, both sides banging away at each other, and General Ryle eventually falling back across the Chippewa River. So it's an American victory, tactical victory with the uh, Ry uh, Ryle's army falling back. And that's why they fought later, 20 days later, at Lundy's Lane. Can't comment on the play of it. It plays the same as Chrysler's Farm because it still uses the card action system. And of course, if you buy one set of cards, you can use the cards for all three games. So that's it for um, Chippewa. Again, my only negative comment is really the maps. I just wish for um, they were darker and they had gone done a bit better research on the roads and things like that. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the battlefield of Lundy's Lane and uh, fought on July 25th, 1814. Like I mentioned, the same armies that fought at Chippewa 20 days earlier. Again, I haven't punched this one. Here's the counters. The armies are virtually the same. A little bit larger as they receive reinforcements. This time the army is commanded by General Drummond. And um, General Scott is here. I, you know, it's funny. I thought General Brown was still in command. I'd have to bone up on this one. But Scott is here, Porter and Ripley. And uh, this battle like many battles of the War of 1812, is odd in the sense that this battle commenced at about 6 p.m. 
at dusk on July 25th, a hot summer day. Let's take a look at the terrain. Well, there's your Niagara River here. This is the Portage Road, which should have been included on the Chippewa map. And this is Wilson's house here. And it goes up here, and that's the Queenstown Road. This is Lundy's Lane itself, a farm lane leading further up to Mr. Lundy's farm. This is a farm track. Forest here. This is, um, well, it's called Wall Hexides. Um, can't help but think that's a bit overemphasized. But um, it's not a bad map. It shows you Drummond Hill. That's the high ground. The map, again, I think is a little dark, but at least it's better than the other two. So it's not a bad depiction of the battlefield of Lundy's Lane. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the ground, uh, Niagara Falls is just over here. Niagara River, the falls are just about here. The city of Niagara Falls today has more or less grown up all around this. So this is all commercial land now. Very little of the battlefield is left. The church area is left with a small plot of ground around it. Drummond Hill Cemetery. That's where Laura Secord happens to be buried too. Now I had the great pleasure of working at the Lundy's Lane Historical Museum for a month in November, I think of 74, as part of a field placement. So I got to know the Battle of Lundy's Lane fairly well too. I got to see lots of neat artifacts from that battlefield. I used to visit the battlefield all the time here. Like I said, there's not much left, just the Drummond Hill Cemetery. But it's an interesting battle and it's a savage one. It's pretty straightforward. The American army came up here near dusk. The British army was deployed here on top of Drummond Hill with guns. And the two armies went at it well into midnight. There was charge, counter charge, back and forth, very bloody affair. In many ways, it reminds me of the cornfield at Antietam. Here there was hand-to-hand -hand combat, and in the dark too. People firing at point-blank range. It was a very ugly affair. Strange thing about Lundy's Lane, both sides claimed victory. Now, when the battle ended towards mid midnight, more or less just petered out, the Americans were in possession of the guns on the top of the hill, so they could claim victory. It was a tactical American victory, so yeah, they held the ground. It's an American victory, tactically, kind of a Pyrrhic victory. Drummond's army fell back. The next morning, the Americans could not hold the hill. They were too exhausted. So they fell back down the Portage Road to Port Erie. Drummond reoccupied the heights, and he could claim strategic victory for the British, which it was. The American invasion of Canada, once again, had been blunted. So Lundy's Lane is very much a soldier's battle, bloody affair indeed. Now using the same system as the other uh, games, um, again, I don't think you play these games to study Napoleonic tactics. It's a simple game, very much like the blue and gray quads. And of course, if you buy the cards once, you can use them in all three games. So that's it for my uh, look at the three games on the War of 1812. Um, of the three, I think my favorite would actually be Lundy's Lane because the armies are evenly matched. It's a soldier's fight. It's a bloody battle. There's a clear objective trying to take the hill. I think that would probably be my favorite. But I've yet to play it. Chippewa, yeah, it doesn't interest me as much. It's just an open field con conflict, much like Lundy's Lane, though. Chrysler's Farm, well, Chrysler's Farm is such a special battle and is extremely hard to simulate with such a simple system. So I think the series is a good introductory one if you want to introduce somebody to war games. I mean, War of 1812 is one of those obscure wars that most people don't know about anyway. But uh, it's a good introductory series, and I'm glad that they were made. I've already mentioned my little nitpicks and criticisms of the series. So your mileage may vary depending on uh, which title you buy. So that's it. That's all. And thank you for watching.